So I wanna welcome everybody to the Breakfast Club of New Jersey. And the Breakfast Club of New Jersey is a group that was founded shortly after the events of 9-11. It was started by a few professional friends uh, in transition, or I should say professionals who were in transition that were also friends. And they met regularly to strategize about their job search and assist each other during uh, shortly after the, the events of 9-11, and it was a very stressful time for them. Uh, one of those people was a gentleman, Frank Kovacs. I think Frank is on the call. And uh, he's also the one who, beyond just the group that was meeting, really accelerated it and turned it into what the Breakfast Club is now and uh, remains not only our founder, but our group's leader. Uh, there are ter ter currently uh, 10 people, 11 people, I believe, in total that are part of the group's leadership. So uh, there's a little bit of labor of love that a few people do put in to do different tasks. Um, usually when you go to a meeting, uh, it does get quite busy, but you look for a person that's got a badge like this one, and that lets you know who one of the leaders. Always you can ask a question there uh, to that person. Uh, the group's total membership is over 6,000 people over the years. So there's a lot of connections that are available to you by joining and being active with the Breakfast Club of uh, New Jersey. Uh, we have a couple of um, different types of ways to keep in touch with us. Of course, uh, any member that you want, you can reach out to personally and have a one-on-one. -on -one. But to start off, we do have a website. The website is thebreakfastclubnj.com, thebreakfastclubnj.com. Websites chock full of information, uh, so it can be very useful and helpful for, for some of you. Certainly, it keeps you informed as to what's going on with the upcoming meetings and connections, so it's a good resource. Check it out once in a while. Um, other ways, uh, there are other social media sites that uh, we are active. Uh, Adrian uh, does keep those on uh, up to date and online. Um, we have a Yahoo group. A Yahoo group is pretty much our primary way of communicating. Uh, among ourselves, or it's an easy way to do so. Uh, in the upper right corner of the website, there's a button called Join the Breakfast Club. So you click on that. The Yahoo group has uh, well over 2,400 active members right now. Um, you can email the Yahoo group any sort of information, uh, question that you want. It's uh, the Breakfast Club NJ at yahoogroups.com. The, the Breakfast Club NJ Yahoo Groups .com. You can use that to introduce yourself, maybe use your elevator pitch if you're new to the group. Um, thousands of people will be able to see and read that. Ask a question, seek advice, um, you, you know, share some information that you have that's not helpful to you, but helpful to someone else. Like you may have received a uh, an email from a recruiter for a wonderful job that just doesn't apply to you. Uh, post that, uh, you may be able to share that with others. Uh, sharing uh, the positions you receive could be important. And as Frank likes to remind us, it's not to be used for non-job related activities. Uh, I think Frank is still struggling to sell a boat. Reason why is that's what he uses as an example. So if you got your boat for sale, other means for doing it, but not our group's website. There's also a LinkedIn group. Uh, LinkedIn, of course, is probably the most powerful tool online that uh, someone who's a job seeker can use. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group, The Breakfast Club NJ, The Breakfast Club NJ, over 1,800 members in that group alone. And those are all people that have been through The Breakfast Club and use it in a similar way that you would the Yahoo group to share information, to reach out, to connect. Uh, when you connect to someone in our LinkedIn group, <clears throat> no matter how many first degree connections you have, uh, you really accelerate that by up to the 1800 that are there. You now can connect to those people through LinkedIn, even if they're not a first degree connection. In addition to LinkedIn, in addition to Yahoo, uh, we're on Twitter, so follow us there. We're on Facebook, you can follow us there. Um, one announcement we usually wait till the end of the meeting, I'll just uh, announce it right now, is our next month's meeting. Uh, next month is a wonderful person, Sharon Busey will be presenting. Uh, she visited our group uh, a few months ago, several months ago, for one of those quick five minute introductions. Uh, but she does um, training and uh, high demand certification. So her program is advanced, secure, or transition your career with high demand certifications. So you don't need to go back to college and get a four year degree. Uh, some skills are just developing so quickly that programs are developing certifications uh, separate from uh, more traditional training. So uh, you may wanna go ahead and uh, visit us next month, uh, second Saturday of the month. Uh, let me get my calendar up quickly. It's gonna be May 9th. 
<clears throat> There'll be more information about uh, the virtual connection. It's most likely that we ha will have the virtual meeting in May. Don't yet know about June. So just look for that information in Meetup and our email and uh, on our website, the other ways that we promote. Uh, just as we get started in a moment, um, letting you know I'm wearing all the hats today. So I am the facilitator, I am the topic leader. Um, and so uh, uh, I'm Frank will, and the others from the Breakfast Club are not going to be uh, participating as actively as they might normally. Um, the slide deck uh, that I will use for the program is gonna be on the Breakfast Club uh, website. Uh, I did send it off to Adrienne yesterday. She's going to post it on the speakers page, and that's in one of the menus on the Breakfast Club, so you'll be able to download it right from the Breakfast Club of New Jersey website. Uh, just for, as Frank likes to say, good citizenship, uh, please keep your audio on mute. Um, uh, we're not going to use audio actively at all. The um, uh, reason why is uh, we're a pretty large group. We're becoming a large group right now. Uh, let's see, we've got 65 people. If audio is on and asking questions, it would just be a little bit difficult maybe to hear among each other. And some of us have background noises as well. And so we don't want to just this, uh, erupt each other. Um, if it does get a little loud, I'll probably just click the unmute, or I'm sorry, the mute all button, uh, keep us all quiet. Um, you can keep your video on or off, that's your choice. Um, some people want to and some don't. Um, we're not really actively using it as an interactive session. Um, but uh, certainly, um, if you want to ask a question during the meeting, um, we're gonna be using uh, a chat option. And the chat is available on your go to meeting screen in the upper right corner, you see a little like cartoon bubble. And if you click on the cartoon bubble, uh, what you'll see is a chat window will open. Uh, during the presentation, about halfway through, and at the end, I have an intermission at the middle, and then we'll sum up at the end. So you are welcome to send a message. So at the intermission, that's when I'll take a look and start reading through some of the chat questions. Um, uh, you know, try and be as efficient as possible. Don't write a, a very, very long message. It just takes me a long time to read through it in chat, but I don't want to discourage you at all from asking a question. But we'll have time in the middle so we can make this webinar style presentation just a little bit uh, more interactive and virtual. And then again, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the meeting, we will also have time for questions. Okay. So that's it. So we will get ourselves into it. I will share my screen right now and uh, start the program. Okay, minimize that. And I think we are good to go. So uh, good, so welcome. Let's, let's get into how to work as a consultant, specifically in the gig economy. Okay. And uh, George, you get appreciation. I'm running this a little bit like a studio. I have a second PC, second monitor. That's just kind of my way of making sure it's presenting properly. So um, this is working as a consultant. It's really an alternative to permanent and full-time employment. And um, uh, so it's really an opportunity for us to consider if you've only been considering full-time work as your, as your primary search, you may want to consider searching as a consultant or um, a temporary employee, not necessarily part-time, but temporary. Um, it is a way to um, get yourself active and in the job market and to earn some income. So we will get into that right away. Um, want to let you know, come on, there it goes. There are some pro program caveats, just be aware. I am not an attorney, I'm not an insurance or a tax professional. Um, I did see there is at least one attorney watching right now. Uh, please uh, stay mute. Um, but I want to let you know that really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm talking to you as a friend, one person, one friend who's been through this as a process. I was in a 30 year corporate career. Uh, now I'm independent since uh, 2014, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I'm trying to just give you uh, my observations of my journey, my experiences to share with you. There'll be a number of times through the program that I'll actually remind you, you may need to consult with an actual tax or insurance or business attorney professional to see if what we're talking about applies specifically to you. So just be aware that that's the case. So um, I'm not one of these professionals, but I play one on TV, as I said, I'm that old commercial. So we will get ourselves right now into the program and talk a little bit about what is the gig economy. And there are lots of definitions out there and I'll just kind of sum it up. But companies now tend to hire contractors more, independent consultants and temporary em employees 
uh, for a specific project. And that specific project is the gig. And a lot of us are concerned that it's very short term and it's not always the case. There are short term projects and there are also long term projects, but it tends to be very specific. And we'll talk later about uh, contract to hire, but typically you go in the mindset that this is for a very specific need and contract. The gig workers, those of us, we are, we are those independent contractors, or it could be a contracting firm that has employees or other part-timers that they put on a temporary project, um, or they, they may be very flexible type jobs. And that's what the gig workers are. So if we're working in the gig economy, we are gig workers. Oops. And uh, but it is for many of us is going to be the future of work. It's really going to be a way for us to stay very competitive uh, and uh, professionally active in an, uh, an economy. <clears throat> excuse me, that is working in this mindset of let's just get the projects done, let's get those gigs done. So, what is a consultant? And really, you're someone who provides skills or service, expert advice to others professionally. And you may scratch your head and say, yeah, but that's an employee. Yeah, I get that. Um, but you tend also to be working on a fixed project. So you bring it, they bring you in for that expertise. They have a specific project in mind. And typically, as the project winds down or ends, um, so does the contract. And in essence, what you are is you're a hitman. You come in to do a job and you go out. And I found this. These are the most popular and famous New Jersey hitmen that there are. And so I thought it was very relevant to bring these folks in. Let's talk a little bit about working as an employee and working as a consultant. And this is just a very high level chart. There's lots and lots of differences. Um, none of them are hard or complicated, but I just want to do some of the basics that maybe you're most familiar with. Certainly when you're employed, you receive benefits. And for a lot of us, that's why we continue to look primarily for full-time employment. As a consultant, you typically don't get paid benefits. And we'll talk more about how, to, how your compensation works later, but you know, it's all on you. Um, some people didn't know that your FICA tax, which is Social Security and Medicare, typically is 50% paid by the employer. It is another benefit. <clears throat> so um, um, when you're a consultant, you pay that yourself, all 15.3%. So typically the employer pays, uh, what's that, 7.65%, pays half of it. So another benefit. So you're, that's all on you. It's paid a tax time. You paid <clears throat> on his employee, you're paid by a check. Uh, typically every pay period, for some people it's weekly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly, however that is. And at the end of the year, your employer gives you a W-2. Um, as a consultant, typically you're issuing an invoice. And at the end of the year, they give you a Form 1099, specifically a 1099 MISC or miscellaneous. Well, most of us are getting 1099s anyway from our banks or fund companies and whatnot. Those are 1099 INT for interest, DIB for dividends, there are others that are out there. Um, your income and payroll taxes are always paid in your paycheck. Um, usually it's a thing when you open up your paycheck and look at it is when you have your raza fraza raza fraza moment and how come they're taking so much out. Um, but on the other hand, it's a nice convenience that companies are doing that. Um, but you pay your income and tax uh, quarterly, typically quarterly. Um, quarterly, you file estimated taxes at the end of the year with all of our typical income tax, you file the full tax return. So you are paying it quarterly. That's what typically happens. Also, as an employee, you really have limited income tax deductions. Um, there were some people that were taking some business expenses, deducting their home office. Um, maybe they travel with a laptop, even though the office gives them a co computer. Um, a lot of those have gone away with the uh, tax law changes that occurred just a couple of years ago. So you will need to speak to your accountants about that. But typically as a consultant, most of those tax deductions are still there. So um, I'm using my um, uh, Logitech camera on my uh, Dell PC and my HP monitor. I've deducted all these over the years. They are business expenses for me. Um, and also part of my home office is deductible, but typically as an employee, it wouldn't be. And by the way, we're talking in the context of if you're a bit independent. Of course, if you are employed by a consulting company like in a, a Deco or Robert Half, if you're employed, you're really treated as an employee uh, from benefits standpoint, tax-wise, and, and taxes and all that and deductions. Um, so just be aware that we're talking really when you're 
uh, independent. And we're going to talk about different independent company structures a little later. So what's in it for the client? <clears throat> Why is the client looking to hire consultants? Well, it's typically easier to hire and terminate uh, consultants. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, a little bit of a frog in my throat. So they, it's typically easier. They don't always go through HR. They don't go through the legal department. Uh, but if they were had to terminate an employee or bring on an employee, it goes through a different budget process and a different a staffing process in terms of HR and um, legal. Typically, there's no long-term commitment. And you might argue, well, with full-time employment in an at-will state, there's no long-term commitment. And well, yes, that's true too. But you kind of know that this is gonna be a three, six, 12 month, whatever contract. And it's just stated out there where when you're employed, you're kind of hoping that it'll last for a long time and it may or it may not. <clears throat> often they're looking for an objective seasoned team member. Um, now, often when they employ people, they should be doing that as well. But a lot of times you're you're brought in as that hitman, as that person who specifically has uh, a skill set that they want to fill. And sometimes as an employee, they'll bring you on maybe and teach you that skill set, but they're looking for someone that they're comfortable sticking with for a long time. And similar to the skills that the employed person doesn't have. They may bring you as an employee because they see you being a team member for a long time. <clears throat> and they will train you accordingly. So as a consultant, you come in with that skill, you come in ready to work almost on day one. <clears throat> and ultimately for companies, it can save them money. They're not paying for benefits, they're not paying for training, which of course can be expensive. They're not paying for your time off and lots of other things, um, other benefits that they may offer consultants. So it can be a money saver for them. But what's in it for you, you the consultant? Well, it fills a, a resume gap. Um, there is an unemployment bias. Uh, if a hiring manager has two resumes on his or her desk, has a choice between the employed person and someone who's unemployed, and they otherwise have similar skill sets, statistically, they're going to hire the someone who's already employed. So this fills a resume gap. You don't have as many long, big gaps on your resume. You're usually paid more on an hourly basis than the employees. Uh, they realize it's short term. Um, they realize that they're covering other expenses you may have, which we'll talk about later. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I apologize for this interruption. <clears throat> you do get a current position on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, in order to have a 100% complete profile or to have a, an all-star profile, you do need to have a current position. A current position has a start date, but doesn't have an end date. And a lot of us that have been out of work for a few months, it's about time you have to put an end date on that prior employer. Um, but if you're a consultant, even if you're a consultant, <clears throat> but you're not currently on a contract, you are a consultant with a current position and 100% complete profile. You do de develop a variety in your own experience and your, in your resume. You may have an opportunity to work in certain industries um, that you wouldn't as an employee because the employer, <clears throat> sorry, is hiring you for your skill set and not necessarily for the companies that you worked for in the past. There's some people who would love to get into pharma without pharmaceutical experience, but if you're just a hot shot finance executive and they need you for a couple of months, they may bring you in even if you don't have that pharma experience. So it does help you uh, get into a variety of roles. Um, it also creates new opportunities that you may not already have. A lot of us have been scratching our heads and wondering why companies do hire um, younger people. Well, there are probably a lot of reasons, and Marty Latman gives a wonderful program, as Alex Freund and others do as well, about um, ageism. But the companies want your skill. They want your experience. They want your savvy, your cool under fire, under pressure. So they will contract for people, even if they're older, while they may not always hire younger staff. <clears throat> they're not as concerned about if an older person fits in a corporate culture or may ultimately more expensive for their benefits or whatever their reasons are. They just want you to come in, do that job, do well for them, and then when you're done, they'll let you go. So it creates new opportunities. And some people are willing to say, I'm willing to be a contract to hire, I just don't wanna be an independent contractor. Well, a lot of times, contract to hire positions are only available if you're willing to be an independent consultant. So be open to it for that reason. The company may not have even realized they needed to hire you until you've worked there for three or four months. So be open to consulting positions and contract positions. 
But if you're not really quite sure and you're thinking, yeah, I really don't want to be a consultant, so let me kind of play devil's advocate a little bit as well. So why should you still not be a consultant? You just don't believe me just yet. Well, for one thing, you know, you may not be treated as well as the employees. A lot of us have seen when we've hired consultants, the staff have cubes and offices and the consultants might have a group of people pooled in a room. Consultants, I'm um, sorry, employees may be going to the uh, summer picnic and annual holiday party and consultants are not invited. And so some people are really concerned about not being treated as well, not invited to all the corporate meetings for the project. That's actually in my mind, uh, short-sightedness on the, on the project manager. You actually may be treated better. The shortest assignment I was ever on, contract assignment, was actually three days. I was on a three-day contract. Um, I found out on Friday, I flew out on Monday, flew home on Thursday. I was in suburban Chicago. Uh, got there early in the morning after my morning flight, about 10 o'clock in the morning, saw the CIO, Chief Information Officer. Uh, he was damn glad to see me and put me in the office right next to him. And then he gave me a list of people I needed to speak with for the project. One of the first people was a senior accountant. And I walked over to her desk, introduced herself, and she later came back to my office and she kind of got angry. And she said, do you know how long I've been looking at this office? I should have had this office. You've been here for one hour and you've got my office. So I was treated a little bit better than her. So sometimes that is the case. You know, you might not be happy. You'll get into an organization, you're on a contract, you know it's gonna be six or 12 months and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be here for this time. I might not be happy. Oh, so you'll move on. And by the way, you might get employed and you might not be happy. So don't work, don't use I might not be happy as an excuse for not being a consultant. Uh, go in, do the job, get paid, get experience, uh, and then move on to your next gig and your next assignment. And you know, you might be happy. You know, there are unpaid administrative tasks. Um, you do have to prepare your own invoices at the end of the year. You may have to provide extra timesheets, other information like that. Um, you do have to spend time near the end of your contract or between contract to look for your next work. But you know what? Give yourself extra large hourly rates. You get larger hourly rates. Uh, you'll be surprised what your hourly rate was when you were actually working as a full-time employee. We're going to talk more about that later. Um, so you'll make up for some of the uh, unpaid administrative tasks that you have to do for yourself. And what a lot of people say is, I just won't be a consultant. I need benefits. I've had a number of people over the years tell me, I'm willing to wait as long as it takes to find that full job, full-time job to get the benefits. And I understand it is important, especially the medical benefits can be very expensive and you want to get those benefits. And I typically ask the question when they tell me they'll wait as long as they can. How are you paying for benefits now? And some people don't have very good options. They say, well, I'm paying for a very expensive plan or um, uh, we're on this state Medicaid program. I knew a couple people on. So not a lot of options, not a good quality plan for them. Well, you know what? If you're working as a consultant, even if it's a six month contract, you can buy benefits. You're getting paid plenty of money on that time. So take some of that money. Don't take the money out of pocket. Use some of the income that you're getting from your work and buy the benefits. You know, it may only be short term. I want to do something long term. I need money. I need, I need, you know, my, cover my expenses. I get it. So I did a little quick math. If you were on a six month contract at about $50 an hour, that's about $50,000 a year. Every once in a while asks, is that before or after taxes? Well, if you're getting paid $50 an hour before taxes, $50,000 is going to be before taxes. So that's considered like your salary. So a six month contract, $50,000, where you may be only sitting waiting for full time employment. So for many of us, do consider take that contract. It may really be a benefit. Do I need my own company? So if you're going to work independently, some people are concerned, I need a company. How can I do that? Well, there are a couple of options later that we'll talk about. But typically, no, you don't need your own company. You can work as just a solopreneur, uh, solo entrepreneur, and just hang a shingle out the front of your house or apartment, and you are a consultant. But what if my client does require a corporation that I do have my company? Well, there are some really easy options for you there as well. For one is find someone you know that already has a company. Ask them if they'll hire you. Do realize if they hire you, you'll be an employee, so they're going to collect the hourly rate from the client and you will get paid, they'll take out your taxes and, and manage all that payroll for you. So you, if you're getting paid 
you know, the $50 an hour up front, you're not gonna get all of it because your friend who has the company has some expenses as well and will manage you as an employee. But that's one way to do it. You'll work for that company. Another is you can reach out to another consulting company who does this all the time and ask them if they will hire you. I don't think this is the best option financially, but it is a very easy and convenient one. There's typically a consulting company that does per consulting on a regular basis, they're going to take a big percentage of the hourly rate. It's what they do. Um, so if you're getting paid that $100 an hour, don't be surprised if you hear they're getting 50% themselves. Now, they are going to cover the payroll taxes, but they want to make their money in profit as well. Typically, they're doing recruiting. They have costs as well. You may be able to negotiate their rate down a little bit because they didn't have any recruiting to do for you. You just called them up and said, hey, will you uh, take on this contract, um, but uh, it's available, but I don't know that's always the best option. Uh, a split pay placement company, this is actually a pretty good option. Uh, a split placement company is actually a professional employer. They typically don't do recruiting. Um, what they are is they are a company that will hire you, <clears throat> engage in the contract with your client, and then that's how you establish the relationship to have the company. Um, I've worked with one a number of times called Top Echelon listed right there. I was looking for others. This was one that I found that seemed reasonable enough that if I was still in corporate, I would call them up and talk to them. There are a few others out there, but the way Top Echelon works is um, a consultant would come to me. I want to hire them. They don't have their own LLC or corp. So I'll say, talk to Top Echelon. They will hire you and you'll come on as their, their employee onto our contract. And so nice way to bring uh, on, bring yourself onto a company. They typically take a much smaller chunk than the traditional consulting company. So be aware, that's a, typically a good option. And also uh, for a little independence, form your own LLC, form your own corp. Only takes a few weeks to do. <clears throat> it's not terribly expensive. We're going to talk about some of the differences among these in just a moment. And you are going to want to get something called an EIN or employer identification number. It's like the social security number for a company. Uh, when you report your income, when you fill out your tax information for your company, for yourself working for them, uh, you'll give your employer the EIN. It also goes on your tax return. Uh, so you'll wanna make sure that you get that. Um, in New Jersey, and all this is in the context of my observations of working in New Jersey. This whole presentation is from that perspective. In New Jersey, it's uh, about 100, and I think it's still $128 if you do the whole thing yourself by filing through the state's treasury department. So not terribly expensive to form an LLC. Now here are some common forms of business entities in New Jersey. Now please see the note at the bottom. This is one of those caveat moments. Uh, you know, this is really a very high level, oversimplified discussion of a few business entities that you can form in New Jersey. Um, the, I'm just a friend talking to a friend. You will need to speak to the appropriate legal uh, and financial consultants to see uh, what does apply to you and to the extent of the information I'm providing, how much of it is really accurate or appropriate for you. But it just helps you understand a little bit among some of the different types of entities that are out there. And there are many more than just these four that are out there. Um, one is called the sole proprietor. <clears throat> That's basically you just at the moment saying, I am a consultant. Uh, you didn't form any real legal entity with the state. There's no filing creating an organization. There's no organization documents. If there's any sort of liability, um, and liability we mean in the workplace, that might be you're hired as a finance person, you're doing the books, you make some sort of mistake that causes the company a lot of money, um, they come after you to make up for the loss. So they're going to sue you, whatever. Um, the liability is essentially unlimited. Uh, you don't have a company, they can't sue your company, they're going to sue you. And unless you have any kind of liability insurance, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, they can come after all your personal assets. From an income tax perspective, you know, you'll send them your invoices either at the end of the project or on a an agreed time like weekly or monthly. I typically do my invoicing monthly. And the uh, tax reporting goes on your personal income uh, taxes. It's what's called Schedule C. It's just a pass-through. So if you made $50,000 as a consultant, it just goes $50,000 right in your income tax. The next one, it's really probably the most common for 
independent consultants is called LLC, Limited Liability Company. There are a large number of business entities that are these limited liabilities. See what's the right one for you. Um, but you do form the organization with the state. You do register with the state. You are a legal entity. Uh, my company, you see my logo in the lower right corner, Princeton Technology Advisors, is an LLC. The personal liability is limited. So um, if, if the uh, worker who did the work caused any sort of um, uh, liability at the office that the company would want to be reimbursed, well, the company will come after really two entities. They will come after your company. Your company may not be worth a lot of money. I'm not saying that your company isn't. My company is not really worth a lot of money. I've got a desktop PC. I've got a laptop PC, a monitor, my camera that you're watching, uh, $25,000, $30,000 worth of stuff. So not a lot of, a lot of liability uh, remedy that if a company sued my company. But they'll sue two people. They're going to sue you, your company, and they're going to sue the worker. That's just the way companies work. So um, it's possible that you may still have a personal liability in addition to your corporate liability. Now, if you have your LLC or your corp and you're the company and you put another contractor to do the work, they would sue your company and they would sue that contractor. So that's kind of what the limited means. Again, I'm oversimplifying this. You really need to talk to a professional. But the income does show up on your personal income tax again on Schedule C. And then there are things called corps. So usually you would have the abbreviation INC at the end. Um, they are legal documents. I'm sorry, legal organizations, legal entities in the company. You do file what's called articles of incorporations and you put bylaws together. So it's a, a bit more, uh, a bigger process. It may be appropriate for you. The liability, the personal liability is limited in much the same way. And some people have heard something, well, there's double taxation with corps. Well, with C-corps and maybe others as well, there is. Because what happens is um, you're not being paid by the client, the corporation is and they do file their own tax return. And then they pay you, even if it's your corp, you pay you a salary and then your salary is taxed. And then there are certainly ways where your salary is an expense to the corporation. Is it truly a double tax? Well, uh, talk to your accountant about that. <clears throat> um, but uh, that's that one. And then the S corp, it's another kind. Uh, uh, I don't know a whole lot about the structural differences between them, so please don't chat me that question. Um, but um, it shows up um, on your personal income tax. Uh, instead of getting a 1099 or instead of getting a uh, W-2, you get what's called a Form K-1. It's sort of a partnership type payment, and you get paid that way. One reason why you may consider going down the path of a C corp one reason may be dependent on the amount of income you're generating. You know, if you're generating uh, income on an annual basis in the whole corporation, that's pretty close to your salary. An LLC would be just fine, I would think, as well would be a corp. If you're generating a lot more income, let's say a reasonable salary for someone like you is $75,000. But let's say you earned $175,000 in income. So you pay yourself a salary of 75, and that's your personal tax. The corporation is also taxed for the full 100,000 or the 175. Well, then what happens is there's $100,000 sitting in the corporation. So one kind of tax savings trick would be at the end of the year, that 100,000, don't pay yourself a salary. Don't pay yourself 175,000. Pay yourself a corporate distribution. An accountant will tell you more about what's that really called, but it's not salary. And you can send yourself and give yourself that extra $100,000 as a corporate distribution. Why might you do that? It's not personal income tax. You will not pay the 15.3% employment tax on the distribution. So if you're making some good money, you may want to reorganize yourself if you have an LLC as a corp. A lot of times people ask, does it pay for me to create my LLC in a tax-friendly state like Delaware or Nevada? Uh, no. The reason why is an LLC is only within the state uh, because it's on your personal income tax. It's taxed at your New Jersey state if you're New Jersey or whatever state you live in. However, if you go down the path of a corporation, it may make sense to file a corporation in another state so the corporation would be subject to lower state income tax and then pay yourself a salary, which will be on your local state income tax. 
So at a re real high level, that's just kind of some of the differences among business entities. So we will now take ourselves, uh, give ourselves a little bit of a break. Um, and so you can see if you need to take a personal break, if you need to get some breakfast, after all, we are the breakfast club. Um, if you got some questions, I am now gonna open up the chat and take a look and go back through some of the questions that you posted, uh, if you did. And um, let's see. Give me a moment to just kind of quickly read through this. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, a lot of good morning. Um, would like to hear how to become an approved vendor for a larger company uh, like UBS, Beeline, that's not higher independence. Um, so that's really from the perspective of networking and growing your business, which we're actually going to talk a little bit later down the road. Um, I can't tell you what each company's practice is for bringing on uh, and registering as independents, um, but clearly you're going to need connections, you're going to need a way in. Uh, there may be um, uh, other companies that you can talk with, ask them for that type of advice, but we're going to talk about how to find business a little bit later. Um, so you'd like to like to connect. Good morning. Like to connect. Good. You're using this to help encourage people to connect with you. That's good. And Adrian did my math. So fifty dollars an hour is one hundred and four thousand. Fifty dollars an hour. Yeah, that's one hundred four thousand a year. Yeah. So I and I think I wrote, it's about fifty thousand for six months. Um, and I was trying to show that it's a lot of money for a six month contract, but of course double that. Um, yep. For the year. Many people are asking for LinkedIn invites on this chat. Um, is this chat available after the presentation? I will have to look to see. Um, I know if we were on Zoom, the chats are available. Um, so I will have to look. Um, but you're all asking for LinkedIn invites. Um, I have to see if we have the list of people available. I will forward that to Adrian to distribute uh, appropriate for the group. Um, you can also connect on Meetup, by the way. Uh, so join our Meetup group and connect through there. You can join our Breakfast Club of New Jersey LinkedIn group to see people that are there, and then from there become first degree connections. Um, for clarification, I said it's about $128 to create an LLC. Um, yes, that's in New Jersey. Um, that was the last rate that I saw at the end of 2019. I don't know if the state had raised it. Um, and by the way, everything that we're talking about here with my limited non-official legal and tax information is all from the perspective of New Jersey. By the way, there are actually four states that don't even have LLCs. So 46 states do, New Jersey is one of them. So if any of you are thinking about now moving to Hawaii and semi-retire and start your LLC, Hawaii does not have an LLC. You'd have to go down a different path. Uh, another state nearby in Massachusetts does not have the structure of LLC. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, uh, so Ed is prom promoting, take a look for the book, Small Business for Dummies. Uh, okay. Uh, what type of expenses can an LLC deduct? Um, I'm actually finding anything that I use, just about anything I use for business, legitimately for business, is going to be deductible. Um, it can be certainly the hard equipment that you use. Uh, if you set up in your in your an extra bedroom or a corner of your of a room, an office, and you buy a desk, if you buy a computer, a monitor, your tech equipment, if you buy a laptop bag, if you're really using it for business and for setting up your office, it's deductible. If you are buying insurances, we'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, those insurance premiums are deductible. Now, I'm not talking about you know, your own homeowner's insurance, although it may be, talk to your accountant, that if you're deducting a percentage of your house, a percentage of your house expenses can be deducted as well. So if you say 10% of my house is used for my business, in theory, and talk to your accountant, you may be able to deduct 10% uh, of your heating expense, 10% of your electrical expense, and so forth. Um, if you drive your car to your client, um, commuting is not typically deductible, but if you go on periodic meetings, uh, go to client meetings, go to um, professional associations, the mileage is deductible. Um, if you acquire the car, 
and you lease it through the company, you have to see if that's appropriate or not, that may be deductible. So there's a lot that's available. Yep. Do speak to your tax professional more about that. Uh, how many billing hours are there in a year? Really, you can't do the math. It's about, if I remember, about 1,920. I think that's the number. Um, but remember, you will have um, some other admin time that you may put in. They may not be direct billing. For instance, if you're working nine to five for your client and you're putting in an hour or two a week on top of that for your administration, that's not typically billable time. The flip side is uh, charge an extra five or ten dollars an hour on your rate and you'll just cover your expense that way. Uh, for medical benefits, are there options? We're going to talk about that in a slide in just a couple of minutes. Um, there is an option via the state as well. Um, and we're getting near the end. Connect, connect, connect. Is there a difference between using the state treasury department or something like LegalZoom? Um, well, the end result is no. Um, so if you go through the state's treasury department to form your corporation, um, you can go through an attorney, you can hire an attorney to do that. Uh, LegalZoom, the company corporation, these are online companies that will form them for you. I actually formed my company with LegalZoom. LegalZoom also sells other services on top. Um, you can have access to attorneys, you can have access to a whole slew of documents like sample contracts and stuff like that. So you get other benefits if you want to use. You'll pay a little bit of a premium, um, but uh, you may, and the, you know, they'll, they'll dot all the I's and cross all the T's for you, excuse me. So, um, LegalZoom, the company corporation, hiring attorney may be a very good option for you. Um, oh, so any events, uh, any, anyone has landed, are there donuts in the back of the room? I do not have donuts in the back of the room. Um, I have a curtain back there. There's nothing of interest to you back there. But yeah, by the way, if any of you have landed, you want to just announce that in the chat, you're certainly welcome to, and then we will give you virtual applause. Uh, can we send everyone on the call today? Um, if, if that's available, I will give it to Adrian and I will leave it up to Adrian uh, to decide what to do. So whatever documentation I have for chats and uh, notes and uh, people who have participated, there are 69 on the call right now, I will give that to Adrian as well. Have you not generated annual income? Can you still file expenses? Um, Remember, I am not an accountant, and I really don't play one on TV. Yes, you can actually have expenses that exceed your income. Um, it's not uncommon for the first year or two when you start a company that your expenses do exceed your income because you're just starting up. And the IRS typically understands that. A lot of us will argue the IRS doesn't really understand anything when it comes to people. You do need to speak to your own accountant or tax professional to see what's appropriate, um, but it is not... Uh, unusual to have a tax loss uh, at the end of the year uh, because of the way you're deducting expenses. The IRS does kind of keep an eye on people that have a tax loss year after year after year to make sure you're just not generating a tax loss from a hobby. Uh, but do speak to your own accountants about that. Okay, so we are at the end of our Q&A. So I get to close this up and we will move ourselves along right now and we open the next curtain. Gee, I remember those days when movie theaters had an intermission. So how much should I charge? Um, so it, it, Marty, you're on, the, you're on the call today. It depends. So I think I should answer more questions with it depends and not just say I'm not an accountant and I'm not an attorney. Um, but, you know, there's a way to help guide you to what is the proper rate that I should charge when I'm an independent consultant. And so this slide is meant to give you a little bit of clarity and a little bit of idea for it. For it. Really, you're going to charge what market rate is. You're going to charge what the market typically pays someone for your type of consulting service. And so what is the market rate? You have to do a little bit of research. I'll show you a, a link in a moment. But if a consultant like you typically receives $100 an hour, the market rate is probably somewhere between $75 and $125 an hour, you know, depending on uh, certain uh, outside situations or conditions. You might have a specific unique expertise you can charge a little bit more you may be a bit of a generalist you charge a little bit less you'll figure that out and so that's kind of how you gauge what market rate is but here's an hourly calculator 
and this will tell you how many weeks there are, how many hours there are in a year. Uh, you take your last annual salary uh, and you divide it by 52 weeks. Now you know how much you got paid by week. And then you divide it by 40 hours. All right, you can divide by 35 or 37 and a half, but the, the, all, the goal is you want to try and understand what your hourly rate is. Some of us had IT and, and other back office. You said, well, I work 10 hours a day and I work five days. Don't go by that. Don't go by 50 or 60 hours. You weren't really paid for that overtime per se. So this gives you an idea of what your annual salary was and how much they were paying you. And you'd be actually quite surprised that you're probably being paid a whole lot less on an hourly basis than you anticipated. But you have to consider all your other costs as well. And I can't tell you what all those are. Everybody's situation is different. But you have to think about all of your benefits that you would normally provide yourself and your insurance costs and other things, your rent and other things like that, any administrative costs, uh, any PTO that you want to cover, your personal time off, everything that you want to include that's part of your compensation and figure out what those costs are and do a similar calculation. And you add all that together and you'll come up with what you kind of need as an hourly rate. And use that as a little bit of a guide. This was a terrific website I found on uh, Valerie's presentation uh, last month. Um, Valerie S. Williams did a presentation last month on the Essential Checklist, had a lot of websites that were there. And this company, I hadn't seen it before, so thanks, Valerie. Uh, Founder.com, uh, the website, and how much to charge for consulting. So uh, either take a screenshot of this or take your phone out, take a picture, or download the slides later, and you'll be able to get this uh, website if uh, I get through this a little fast. But this uh, provided some additional information, may be a good resource for you as you begin to figure out what should be an appropriate salary for yourself. So what about errors and omissions insurance? Some of us will say, I never make errors and I never omit anything. Well, you know, it's kind of a liability insurance that protects you, the company, or your work is from any sort of uh, accidental negligence. Um, and that's really what that's for. And this, it's a very involved, ultimately involved process, or I should say initially involved process, that ultimately gets you to a simple annual fee. Um, I can't tell you what errors and omissions insurance costs because each industry, each job has a different level of risk and you have to talk to an insurance professional about it. But the basic idea is that it will provide a, a level of insurance protection if you get sued by your client company. And who gets sued? Well, in America, everybody does, or at least everybody involved. So it'll be your company, your LLC, or your corp, whatever. Uh, and it'll be the workers that you've brought on board. So um, now, if, if they were involved in the project. So do be aware of that. And, um, you know, there are a lot of details to errors and omissions insurance and things that you have to check. So I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, scenarios. You may say, well, I want a million dollars of coverage because when I go to do the job, if ever there's an accident, I want to just make sure I have that protection. Others will say, well, that's not a problem. I have an umbrella insurance policy at home. It's good for a million dollars. That covers me. No, umbrella insurance is personal insurance, not business insurance. It's likely not going to cover you. Maybe you have the type of business where every once in a while, the delivery company, UPS, FedEx, Postal Office, has to deliver a package to you. Maybe you're taking equipment, you're going to set it up on behalf of your client and then bring it and install it at your client. Well, what if the delivery person falls down on your front step and breaks his leg, injures himself? You may say, well, there's no problem. I've got homeowner's insurance and I've got umbrella insurance. No, those are personal insurances. They may not cover you for your home office. Now, you can contact your insurance professional and get riders or attachments for business on your homeowner's policy, or you may get a separate insurance policy. What if you are in your car, you have su sufficient automobile insurance, you're driving to your client because it's time to have a meeting or you're going to, to visit them, and you get into a car accident. Well, if you happen to let your insurance company know, well, I was on my way to, to a client meeting when I got sideswiped. Your auto insurance company may say, your car is not insured for business. So do understand, there's a lot of little things that you just have to pay attention to. Speak to your insurance professionals about that. Do I need errors and omissions insurance? Well, it depends on your level of risk. It depends on your tolerance for risk. If you have a lot of 
well, money in the bank and you can tolerate these, uh, you know, if you got in sued, you maybe you don't need it. Are you doing a job that has the potential for risk? Um, you may need it. If you're not, if you're only working in your home, never go out of the house, never order packages. If you think that's a risk you can tolerate, you may not. So you have to talk to other professionals about that. But this is just meant to give you a little bit of guide, guidelines, open your eyes a little bit. This is my most favorite topic. Do I need to collect sales tax? And the reason why it's my favorite topic, I think will come to light in just a moment, because um, I asked myself this question when I started my business, do I need to collect sales tax? And I decided to register, which is real easy to do anyway, just in case I did need to collect sales tax. And then I went to um, a presentation by the state of the New Jersey's Treasury Department, and that's where the fun was. So, Yes, only for taxable products and services. Now, by the way, this is in the context, again, of New Jersey. So it is possible that if you are based in uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, any other state, you have uh, different guidelines. Um, so do be aware. So um, yes, you do need to collect sales tax for taxable products and services. And you may ask, well, what's a taxable product? Well, in New Jersey, this is what I was told. Products are taxable unless New Jersey says they're not. That is the exact statement that the um, nice woman at the Treasury Department told me. I wrote it down and uh, word for word, and then I put it on this slide. And I raised my hand and I said, how do I know which products are taxable? And then she directed me to a website on the Treasury uh, site. I decided not to put it here because I found that the link changes every once in a while. But they provide this whole link in the page, a whole list of links in the page of uh, hundreds of other links to different types of products. You do have to look at all the different types of products that you may be selling and representing. So I'll give an example. We know in New Jersey, in most cases, food is not taxable. Soda is food. I drink it once in a while. That's a taxable item. So you're buying it at the same supermarket that you're buying your milk. The soda is taxable. One fun one was um, if you buy a handkerchief, a nice white handkerchief, you use it for you know, personal hygiene, not taxable. If you buy a colored handkerchief in New Jersey, that's taxable. They don't consider a colored handkerchief uh, a necessity. I guess they consider it as a, a pocket square. Um, I've always thought that was a little short-sighted. If I had a bloody nose, I'd carry a red handkerchief. Why should I pay tax for that? That's just the world according to me. And then I was told services are not taxable unless New Jersey says that they are. And the nice lady looked at me and said, before you raise your hand, and she directed me to another web page that had more links, dozens and dozens of links of different types of services. So what I learned for myself as an IT consultant, the types of service I, I do are not taxable because usually tax is paid to end users. Um, sometimes, what, so what may happen is it's a service that I'm performing to a company who in turn is performing it to an end user and that's where they're collecting the tax. So, but if I do uh, install um, some equipment, if I brought a server in, installed the server, the cost of the server is taxable because they are the end consumer of it and the service to install it is taxable because it's tied to a taxable item. So think about other things more personally. Uh, if you've ever gotten a haircut, haircuts and gone to or gone to a salon are not taxable services. Um, if you've ever gone to you know, buying food, of course, it's not taxable. But if you go to a restaurant or if you buy prepared food, that is taxable because the service went went on it. And because the service combined with the, the food item, I guess, has become a taxable event. Just be aware. You do file your sales tax quarterly. There's a website. Um, and, uh, and if you have collected more than $10,000 a month in sales tax, you actually file monthly. Um, but it's a, it's a web address and it's a form to fill out. I actually did mine last week for the first quarter. Um, uh, I basically said, this is how much money I earned in the quarter. And then the very next line is, this is how much is excluded from sales tax. And the rest of it became zeros. And I file it. I, I don't file only one time I collected sales tax and had to file it. Now, here's the web address for filing uh, to getting registered for um, uh, sales tax. So if you don't take the screenshot or get your camera out in time, remember, you can download these slides and get it then. Uh, and then you'll get a sales tax certificate like that. Uh, that is mine. 
Um, what I've learned after the Mueller report, I redacted my sales tax certificate so you don't steal anything. Uh, but this is what it looks like. I've just got it in a drawer with some other information about my company. And so you'll get a certificate like this. So how to become a consultant. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that it's really very viable, you should consider doing it. What really are the steps for doing it besides forming the company and other things like that? Well, the very first thing, if we were all sitting in the uh, days in right now, I would ask you to repeat after me, maybe raise your hand, put your hand over your heart and say, I am a consultant. It's just that easy. And if you said that uh, in your office right now or home office, you are now a consultant. That's really just as easy, just what it is to become a consultant. All the other things beyond that, that we talked about already and the few things remaining are just the details to get you to be there officially and legally. But very important, you need to identify your niche, where you're gonna work, where you have knowledge, where you have experience, and also where you have a support mechanism. When you used to work for a corporation, if you ever stumbled across something that you didn't know, you had people in the company that you could talk with, your boss, your coworkers, people in other departments. But when you're working by yourself, you have to cult cultivate that on your own. Google is a great place to find resources, professional associations, lots of places, uh, former colleagues. And also you wanna make sure you understand where you really are an expert, because most companies, most individuals don't hire generalists. They hire experts. They hire you for your expertise. They may hire as a consultant. They may employ you <clears throat> as a generalist and teach you that one thing that's really important, but as a consultant, they want you to be a, a, an experienced person. So make sure you understand that. And then choose and research your target market. You know, a lot of people in back office type positions, if you're in sales, if you're in, in consulting for IT, if you're consulting for finance, a lot of back office, you think, I could work anywhere. Yeah, but again, don't be a generalist. Figure out the market that you really want to penetrate or the industry that you really want to penetrate, and then you become known as the person who's experienced and the expert in there. So for me, I only target small business and not-for-profit organizations. I don't target big companies. It's just not a place I feel I can compete competitively. I can be competitive right now. Okay. Also, let your professional network know. Let them know you have chosen to be a consultant. Uh, put them to work to you. There are a few of you on this call. I've seen you promote on the Breakfast Club in um, LinkedIn and on the Yahoo group every once in a while. You let us know what you're doing, what you're up to. Do the same thing for your corporation and for your business. Um, and make sure you do include your accountant and lawyer, hopefully before you get started, but certainly let them know once you do. But you want to make sure you alert your network. And then also develop a business plan. Now, a business plan, a lot of people think is this big, bulky document that has lots of information, and it really doesn't need to be. It can be as simple as a page. My business plan is simply a page that basically talks about these things that I've already talked about. Identifying my niche, where do I have experience, where's my most knowledge, the target market I'm gonna be, the types of companies I'm gonna I'm going to uh, look to uh, market myself to, not the specific companies, but the types of companies. And my business plan is essentially one page. Um, if you want to know what the difference is between that and a 100-page business plan, besides 99 pages, those bigger business plans have to talk about projections, a lot of projections, how you see your growth going, what is your cash flow, how your cash flow is going to change, how are you going to facilitate the change in cash flow. There's just a tremendous amount of information that goes into that. The reason why that's necessary mostly is if you're going to seek some sort of financing. If you're going to go to venture capitalists, if you're going to go to banks, they're not going to lend you money <clears throat> unless you can prove to them or get them comfortable with the idea that you really have a good plan in front of you. So a business plan for most of us can really be very small, but it is important because it's good to take that out every once in a while and just remind yourself just what it is you do best. <clears throat> so some things to do now that you are a consultant. Well, name and create your company. I'm of the opinion the name of your company should not be a cute name. And um, I'm not gonna use a cute name that I know that I use as an example in case that person is on this call. But um, if you if you had a, a company and you called it something like, oh, just for giggles, you said, oh, that's cute. And I say that statement all the time and people know me as someone who likes to giggle. And um, uh, you may wanna say, well, what do you do? 
Well, unless you probably have like a clown service, um, it's not very indicative of what you do. If you're an IT person, if you're a finance person, if you're going to be a business analyst, you probably should have a name that kind of goes along with that. Uh, it's good when, uh, in a, for a Google search, Google likes to understand what you do, so it becomes relevant. And then create your company. So come up with a name. Now, the Treasury website, if you're going to be going down the path of creating an LLC or company, um, has a web page where you can look to see if your name is already used in New Jersey or in the state that you're applying. Um, when you create a name of your company, name of my company is Princeton Technology Advisors, nobody else in New Jersey can register the same name. Now, it doesn't mean that someone can't be a sole proprietor with the same name. <clears throat> That's possible. But you want to, if you're going to, you want to, uh, you are going to want to create your company uh, either going down uh, the path of through the state or begin to do the formation on your own. And then right away, register your web address. You do have to create a website, but register your web address right away, especially if you've uh, registered your name through the state treasury department. The name of your company in the Treasury Department is in the public domain. Anybody can look. Uh, as I just explained, you're going to look to see if your name is available. If it is, you'll register it. Well, there are some unscrupulous people um, that will like to look for newly registered companies, and then they go on and they steal, they acquire website addresses all in advance. And you may find that you later, weeks after you've registered with the state, try to register your web address and it's taken. These people are called squatters. I've known two clients that that's happened to. Months ago, they registered the company with the state, and now they've come to me to help them acquire a web address and do some technology work for them. And I've had two cases where um, they were already taken. So register your web address, web address right away. There are companies like GoDaddy that will do it, HostGator, Google Domains. Uh, the best value, in my opinion, is Google Domains. Um, it's $12 a year, uh, and they give you privacy and other things. Uh, GoDaddy and others are good companies uh, as well, very reliable. Uh, you use them because they have much better customer support than Google. Uh, you to navigate Google's customer support, if you bump into a problem, is a little bit harder. Just see what you like. If you're working with an IT person, um, let that register with Google Domains and let them deal with the customer support. Develop your professional support network. Remember, where do you have um, a support network? It could be former coworkers. It could be professional associations. Begin to get involved and alert that network of people and organizations, because as you begin to work on projects for your clients, if you stumble across something where you need assistance, you're gonna have to answer and complete that for your client right away, and you may need to go to someone outside your own company to get that information for you. You may need to acquire certain licensing or certain certifications. Certain industries in the state of New Jersey, I suspect most states, do require licensing. Most consulting type businesses, business consulting, do not require state licenses, but you will have to consult with your own legal professional about that. And then there are certifications that you may need. Um, for example, I am not uh, a project management professional. I'm not certified by PMP. Professionally, in my corporate career, I've worked on very large and expensive projects. So except for the certification, um, um, I, I, I did all the work, but I, I don't have my certification. You have to see if you're going to compete in an industry as an independent where certifications matter because your, your hiring clients, your prospects may pick someone with those certifications over someone that doesn't have it. So you may need to get those as well. And certainly, don't do this alone, right? No person is an island, to paraphrase. Make sure you contact your support network, certainly your support professionals like your accountant, your lawyer, your insurance professional, and others. Let your friends know, let your coworkers know. And also, here are a couple of organizations that you can reach out to that give out a tremendous amount of free advice and free webinars. SCORE um, is part of the Small Business Administration. Um, the local chapter in New Jersey, there's one in Princeton. Um, there's one in northern New Jersey. I don't remember the location for it. Just look at score.org. If you're in central New Jersey, princeton.score.org. They all run seminars and presentations. Most of them are free. They give you free mentoring. You'll get a mentor. Um, so a great way to get started. Guidance for how to get funding. Um, if you're in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Bucks County has a SCORE chapter as well. So 
use that SBDC, look for the small business development centers as well. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of resources and a lot of them are free. So don't do this alone. And of course, update your LinkedIn profile. At the very least, your LinkedIn profile is gonna say, I am a consultant. Put down that you are a consultant on your LinkedIn profile. It's gonna have a start date and no end date. So it can get you closer or maybe complete the process of becoming a LinkedIn all-star and having a 100% complete profile. Even if you do not yet have a paying client, put it on your LinkedIn profile. Your bullet points may not be accomplishments, but instead they're gonna be the service offerings and the other expertise that you have. Those are the keywords that will help get you a little bit attractive. So yeah, do add that right away to your LinkedIn profile. So let's talk about ways to generate business. Now that you're a consultant, you're gonna to have to generate business on your own. When you worked for a company in an office, the boss gave you a pile of stuff to work on and you have to go find that on your own. There are local business networking groups. There's a lot of them that are out there. BNI, LATIP are very large organizations with chapters all over the country. Um, a lot of uh, more active uh, towns actually have multiple chapters. I know Princeton has multiple chapters. The way BNI and LATIP works typically, um, the groups are medium sized. They can get large, they're typically medium sized. Uh, 15, 20, 30 people are probably good size. Anyone in the group typically are uh, independent or they work independently in a big company. That's what typically is happening. But when you join the, the local chapters of those groups, you are the only one of that profession or the only one of that line of business. For instance, um, I belong to two such groups, one in Princeton and one in Bucks County. I am the only IT person in the group. And as long as I maintain my membership, there will not be another IT person. In one of the groups, there is somebody who's a content writer, see, you know, for social media. I don't do that. So for me, that's fine. We don't compete, she and I. It may also be that a group can have multiple attorneys, but one might be a business law and one might be a family law and one might be employment law. There won't be two business law attorneys, but this is a great way to begin to develop your own internal referral network. You'll meet other professionals. You'll get very professionally friendly. Uh, you'll be able to be essentially built a professional referral network, a very reliable one. Join meetup.com. A lot of you are already on meetup.com. Uh, if you're not, um, it is a very robust place to find virtually, to virtually find in-person groups. Meetup are groups that meet typically in person, although of course now with coronavirus and the concerns around it, even in-person groups are meeting virtually, but the Breakfast Club and most of the groups on Meetup do have in-person meetings. Do create a profile, it is completely free, there's no cost and to you. The costs are to the group owners. So for example, the Breakfast Club New Jersey's Meetup group is paid by the Breakfast Club. So as a member uh, of uh, Meetup, it's free. Create a profile, put keywords. Um, there are keywords that Meetup will allow you to choose from. Use those. Don't use, uh, don't only use uh, ones that you'll put in there yourself. And then Meetup will begin to send you emails letting you know that there are groups in the area that meet your profile. Join, don't join, go visit once. You may like it, keep going back. If you don't like it, don't go back. But it's a great way to begin to find these groups. Some of the BNIs, LATIPs, and other business network working groups, they promote there as well. In addition to Meetup, join and participate in LinkedIn groups. Uh, so maybe you're already a member of the LinkedIn group for Breakfast Club of New Jersey. If not, um, that's what your mission for a little later today to reach out and join us. Uh, LinkedIn groups of all types, of all industries, personal, business. Uh, these are primarily or mostly virtual groups, although some have extended to become in-person groups, but it's a great way to make other connections uh, professionally and personally and uh, maybe a way to help generate and promote your business. Attend business and professional associations, attend conferences. You'll tend to find people in your industry of interest in these professional associations. In some cases, you'll find people like you that may help you grow your professional network and your support network. In other cases, you'll find prospects, uh, potential clients. So great places to meet uh, business professionals. And always activate and alert your business network. And there's lots of ways to do that, whether it's on social media, sending an email, reaching out and calling. 
keep yourself active and keep your network working for you. Okay. And yeah, as you be active on social media. I can tell you that the, um, as Marty Lapman would say, the best social, social media site, uh, site to be on is it depends. It depends on your clients, on your audience, on where the people you want to reach out to are typically going to be. You want to be on the same social media sites that your competitors are on, not just your clients. Uh, the reason why is if your competitors are there, they figure this out. They figured out that the clients are there too. So Facebook is certainly the largest platform in, in the world, over 2 billion uh, uh, users, but it tends to be a, a big mix of uh, residential and non-business people. If your consulting business is going to be towards business professionals, you may want to be on LinkedIn, 600 million business professionals. But if your business is going to be home cleaning services or home construction or something that's going to be more personal to people, Facebook may be a good place. Um, Twitter, uh, YouTube, great place, create videos to be found there. So there's lots. You have to find the one that's right for you and spend some time there. Just start with one. Social media can be terribly overwhelming. I'm sure George Pace can tell you that. Start with one and get good and comfortable with it before you move on to the other. If you look at social media as this kind of big elephant, you'll never take the first bite. Health insurance. It was a question that came up a little bit earlier in the chat. What if I need health insurance? So again, very high level discussion. We're gonna talk, you will need to talk with a business professional, but it's basically a type of insurance that pays for your medical, your surgical, your dental uh, prescriptions, um, those sorts of needs. And uh, do I need it? You, you have to figure out if you do need it, you may get coverage from a spouse or partner. Um, you know, it's, I guess, I don't know if it's still technically a requirement based on the Affordable Care Act. I believe that may have been reversed. Um, but um, if you need it for your own personal health reasons, yes, uh, go out and get it. So at a very high level, some places where you can begin to find and get health insurance. If you're self-employed, you can actually call an insurance company and say, please sell me health insurance. And they will be happy to sell you a policy. This tends to be the most expensive way. And the reason why it is, is um, a lot of times insurance companies, when they have a big collection of people, like at a company, you bought insurance through your company, um, there are people that are using a lot of insurance and there are people using less insurance and it averages out a risk. When you buy your insurance on your own, they will evaluate you individually and your pricing can be very high if you have any sort of pre-existing condition or maintenance medicines or anything like that. So it is an option. Um, you may get a lot of different flexibility, uh, but you do uh, have to consider that if this is the right option or not for you. Another is a group plan. Well, we, we, when you were employed, you were essentially in a group. You might have worked for a company of 100 people, 200 people, you know, five people, whatever, and your company had a group plan. And so the costs can be a little bit less because the insurance company says the risk isn't just on one person in the group. It's an average risk among everybody in the group and becomes a little less expensive. Um, typically, as an individual, you don't get a group plan because you're the only person, but you can find professional associations do offer their memberships um, the ability to buy health insurance. So not all of them do, some do. I don't think you typically see that with chambers of commerce. Uh, one terrific organization, the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. <clears throat> They're uh, a private organization that really represents the, the interests of all businesses in New Jersey. Um, they don't target only small business and independent business, but that's a large part of their membership. Their membership is about, I think, $325 a year to join them. But then there's a whole host of services that you can buy at a discount, uh, shipping services, office supplies you can purchase, and others, including healthcare. So you can join them, and if the cost of healthcare that they can, sit, they can buy through them is less than $325 of the savings compared to independent insurance, it may be worth becoming an NJBIA member, getting the insurance and other benefits through them. Um, the healthcare exchange, healthcare.gov. Um, it's actually called the Affordable Care Act, and it's also known as Obamacare. Um, but register on healthcare.gov. Now, by the way, healthcare.gov, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, is actually not insurance. It's really insurance guidelines. It's the rules that insurance companies that want to compete in the state must follow. And so once you register on healthcare.gov, 
healthcare.gov, and it's easy to register and get an account, um, you then can begin to shop for insurance. And depending on what your state you're in, there'll be different insurance companies that are there. They typically order or offer a range of policies uh, at different levels. Some have a high deductible um, and maybe less expensive. Um, some may cover more, more types of coverages. Some will have less type of medical coverages. You have to look and compare them and pick the one that's right for you. And um, there is typically, well, I believe in New Jersey and other states, a state level of insurance that's offered through the exchange as well. It's kind of a Medicaid type of policy, uh, really meant for people who are in a, a lower income or at the very least currently in a low income uh, scenario. So that could be available as well. Um, there are insurance professionals that you can talk with who can also give you some guidance on this. And Medicare, if you are 65 or older, um, you are eligible to uh, collect or to sign up for Medicare. Actually, you are required to sign up for Medicare uh, when you reach 65. There may be a little bit of a grace period of a few months before and after. Um, now, that may be very useful for you if you are 65, uh, but the other people in your home, if you have uh, children in your home or a spouse or partner that is not yet 65, they cannot be covered on your Medicare policy. That would only apply to you. Medicare does have I'll just call it basic insurance. I'm not going into all the details, mainly because I don't know all the details. I'm not yet 65. Um, but there are supplemental plans that you can buy through insurance carriers that help give you a more robust coverage. So in summary, made it to the finish line. Consulting, it's an alternative to permanent employment. And in the gig economy, this may become more and more relevant to many of us. So be open to the idea. And while there are pros and cons, some of the pros are it is going to fill a gap on your resume. So if your ultimate goal still is to have full-time employment, um, you want to keep and show that you are very active in the employment market. There is unemployment bias. You do get to develop a variety of experiences. You get to make your resume a bit ro more robust and you'll get paid. Uh, rather than um, continuing working from home looking for work, you can get paid as a consultant. You may actually get paid more in the short term because of the, the, the rate, the ability of you to charge rates a little bit higher, and it may lead to a contract to hire opportunity. Um, and you don't need to become an LLC or a corp. But you can, uh, there may be benefits to you to doing so, so it may be a good idea. And then what you do is you declare, I am a consultant and get started. And so that's really just it. That is our program for today. So I will open it up once again for some chat questions. And uh, give me just a moment to go back. Let's see, I hope they didn't go too far back. Okay, so there was that one. Okay, Marty who's answering the expense question. Uh, Hannon, who's an attorney. Um, an important benefit of buying liability insurance, including um, the e &O insurance, the insurance company pays for your lawyer. Oh, okay, good. And it's from Hannon, the lawyer. Um, I mentioned sales tax. Um, taxable, non-taxable is changing, yep, all the time. Uh, what is and isn't taxable uh, all the time does change. Um, Bob gave another company for registering domains, um, namesilo.com, okay. By the way, these websites for registering names, whether it's Google Domains, Namesilo, GoDaddy, what they are is they're, they're more or less just sales companies. There's actually a national registry that it ultimately all goes into. Um, and these are the companies that just have that gateway for you as the end client to the national registry. Um, let's see. Oh, Somerset Score. So that's where they are in Somerset. They meet in um, Bedminster. So Score is available. So thanks for that. Uh, My audio and my lips were not syncing. Oh, sorry about that. Um, it is what it is. Let's see. Oh, there again. Not a lot of questions, a lot of great comments. So thank you. Some nice compliments. Thank you. 
Oh, any concerns transitioning back into full-time employee after being an LLC or consultant? Um, I can't see of any. Um, you may just need to be prepared to ask the question, answer that question, and just have a good story for it. So um, if you've been an LLC or a consultant for, uh, we'll just say a year, maybe at two gigs, and now you're interviewing for a full time, someone may say, I see that you've been an independent consultant. Why are you looking to get back into a company? Just tell them the truth. Um, the, the consulting allowed me to keep active in the marketplace, to be competitive, to keep my skills up, you know, the things that are that the story that you want to tell. And but your ultimate goal is to do some good work for the organization that you're now interviewing. with. I don't see that there's any problem at all. Um, you know, is it possible some hiring managers may not believe you? Possibly. Some may believe that you're a go-getter and really appreciate that and that you uh, take charge of situations. So I don't think any problem about that. Uh, just reading some of the others. Do I miss anything? About, okay, so I, I've been working both in corporate and as a consultant. Do I miss anything about being in direct? Would you miss anything about being in consultant? Um, so you're asking me a personal question, and I don't know that the answer applies to everybody. Um, I would, right now where I am in my career, I would not look back to going into corporate. Uh, every once in a while, I do get um, a request for a conversation. I'm very happy where I am, but also not only my personal situation, my professional situation does allow me to do that. Um, you, there are certainly, um, I'm not paid right now as much as I did in corporate America. <clears throat> It would be nice to, to get more money, so I have to work hard to keep earning my, my clients. Um, but uh, personally, um, uh, my situation allows me to remain independent, have a little more free time, uh, set my own vacation schedule. So for me personally, I'm not looking to go back to corporate America. Um, but it's different for each person. Do you happen to know if any consultants are eligible for the SBA loan program that was recently announced. Um, I spoke to my own financial planner about that, and my understanding is yes. Um, I can tell you I talked with one friend who's an independent who is not a legally registered entity, doesn't have an LLC or a company, was told by the bank he spoke to that they didn't want to process the loan unless he was a legally registered entity, but my understanding is that's the bank's policy they're overwhelmed with loan applications, but as an independent, you can. Do be aware that the SBA PPP loan is primarily meant for covering salaries. So um, it's not meant for a, a lot of operations expense. So the loan that you get um, is really meant, at least if you want to be have the loan forgiven, is going to be meant for salary, 75% or more towards salary. If not, I believe the interest rate is 1% and you'll pay it back over two years with a six-month exclusion. Um, one problem that they're <clears throat> having now is though the banks and uh, credit unions that are processing these are overwhelmed and they've stopped accepting, some have stopped accepting applications. Uh, is Yahoo Groups the best way to share information pertaining to today's meeting? I believe uh, a, uh, between the Yahoo Group and our website, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey's website, will be the best way of getting the information. I'm going to provide later this afternoon the recording of this video to Adrian. She manages the social media and the website. I'm going to. I've already sent her the slide deck. I'm going to look for if I can get the names in the chats. So it'll she'll manage all of that. Will the Breakfast Club open an Instagram account? Uh, better to connect to Gen Y, Gen X. Don't forget Gen Z. Um, it's a Valerie. Uh, I'm sorry. It's a uh, it's a Adrian question again. Uh, I don't know if they're opening other uh, groups. Let's see. Oh, Adrian wrote yes. Uh, yep, and Marty did respond. Uh, independent consultants are able to start filing for the SBA loan, and it was effective yesterday. So there. Where can I find out more about high demand certifications? Uh, well, one place is going to be next month's Breakfast Club meeting. Um, we're going to talk about that. The presenter is coming to talk specifically about high demand certifications. Um, another resource for training um, you could use, there are a lot of these uh, free or 
or some or paid online training. Um, there are a lot of great uh, companies that are out there. Um, uh, some of you know I lead a group in Princeton called PSG or Professional Service Group of Mercer County. On our website, we have a web page that lists 35 different online training organizations. Some of them are free, some of them are subscription, some of them are hybrid, where some of the classes are free and some are not. And they list all sorts of certifications and guidelines around those. So what I would say is you want to go to psgofmercercounty.org. It's all one word, psgofmercercounty.org. Once you get to the home page on the menu along the top, you'll see a, a, a menu item called professional development. When you click on professional development, the new page will open and one of the links is e-learning. Click on that, a page will open with 35 um, e-learning sites. May be a great way to get some uh, certification information. Uh, let's see, Adrian saying slides are on, only the slides are on the website. So, and we'll, we'll have to send an email out or put some information about how to get the video. Um, it's up to the other folks at the Breakfast Club. I know how I might do it, um, but we'll see. And Adrian said she'll send an email about that. So that's the end of our chats. So I want to um, thank you all. This is my personal contact information. Um, you are welcome to contact me uh, if you'd like. Um, on my website, Princeton Tech Advisors, there's a web page called um, uh, Presentations. Um, and in there, uh, actually, yeah. And so in there, you'll see you'll have a choice for different presentations. Uh, all of my presentation slides are there as well. So if you don't find this particular slide deck, on uh, extra, yeah. And if you don't find that slide deck on the Breakfast Club website, um, what you'll do is you will find it on my website as well. So this slide deck is already there. So um, you uh, are welcome to go there. If you have an email that you want to send me specifically, anything about forming the company or whatever I talked about today, you're welcome to reach out to me. So uh, that is our meeting for today. Uh, I want to thank the Breakfast Club for allowing me to uh, present this. This was a fun opportunity. And uh, I hope you got some good information out of it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, stay safe uh, with uh, sheltering in place. And we hope to see you real soon, if not sooner, at least by next month virtually at the Breakfast Club of New Jersey's next virtual meeting. So thank you. Goodbye, everybody.